بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا أما بعد uh, so like last week inshallah ta'ala today as well we're going to choose a very famous sahaba uh, but we don't have much information about him so inshallah we will then spend the rest of the time reading his ahadith and uh, I think that it is very useful in my opinion to go over the ahadith because we will get an idea of the ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so it's an excuse in my opinion uh, to read a hadith just because the, our Sahabi narrated it. The Sahaba we're going to choose today, the Sahabi we're going to choose today is Ubay ibn Ka'b. Ubay ibn Ka'b. And Ubay ibn Ka'b, uh, we only have very limited information about him, but he did narrate a good quantity of a hadith. So we'll have some time with the hadith today. Ubay ibn Ka'b is from the Ansar, from the Khazraj tribe. Therefore, he has no mention in Mecca. Therefore, automatically we are already beginning from the late Sirah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ubay ibn Ka'b was an educated man from the Khazraj. He was one of the few people who could read and write before the coming of Islam. So he was educated. We have no idea how old he was. All that we know is that when he died, he was an old man and he died uh, roughly as we're gonna get to around 22 Hijrah. So we can estimate that when he converted, he was probably already 30, 40 years old. So he's already, a, a generally speaking, an older man. Uh, and he was one of the 70 who attended the Aqaba Treaty, the second treaty of Aqaba. So his conversion goes back to the earliest Madani period. So he's one of the first batch of the Ansar to convert. And when the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina, Ubay ibn Ka'b became the first of the Ansari scribes. Obviously, our Prophet ﷺ had scribes in Mecca. He had people that were chosen to write the wahi in Mecca. The first person whom the Prophet ﷺ chose in Medina to become his essentially secretary, they're called Kuttab or Katibul Wahi. And this is a special category of Sahaba. Um, uh, Al Dhahabi and other great scholars, they wrote uh, treatises, the names of the Sahaba who were secretaries and who would write down for the Prophet. Sallallahu and especially those who would write down the Wahi, the Quran. They have the highest status amongst those who would write because they have been given the greatest honor. So the first of the Ansar to have this honor was Ubay ibn Ka'b. And he would become therefore one of the primary scribes of the Quran in Medina. There are many primary scribes. We will get to Zayd ibn Thabit inshallah eventually. Zayd ibn Thabit is probably the primary scribe of the Prophet ﷺ when it comes to the Quran. But Ubay ibn Ka'b comes second or third in that list. So he became the, one of the greatest of the Kutab al-Wahi. And because of this, Ubay became out of all of the Sahaba, the most knowledgeable person regarding the Quran. And this is an amazing fact because Ubay is not from Mecca. Ubay is from Medina. And Ubay ibn Ka'b excelled in reciting the Quran and memorizing the Quran, so much so that Anas ibn Malik said, only four people memorize the entire Quran in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn Umm Abd, that is uh, Ibn Mas'ud, number one on the list. Ibn Mas'ud, we already gave his biography. Uh, go back to what I gave about tafsil, detailed biography. And Ibn Mas'ud goes back to the earliest um, uh, Meccan converts. And Ibn Mas'ud was the first to recite the Quran in Mecca out loud. And so many things we mentioned about Ibn Mas'ud. Uh, he said, I memorized 70 surahs directly from the mouth of the Prophet ﷺ. That's more than half the Quran essentially. He memorized it directly from the Prophet ﷺ. So number one that is mentioned, Ibn Umm Abd, that's Ibn Mas'ud. Number two, Ubay Ibn Ka'b. Ubay ibn Ka'b. And then others are mentioned, Salim, Mawda, Hudayf, and others. Uh, so Ubay ibn Ka'b is one of the four people who were famous for having memorized the Quran. Now, does this mean that none of the other Sahaba memorized the Quran? Two interpretations. The first interpretation, yes, it means none of the other Sahaba memorized the Quran. How can this be that the other Sahaba did not memorize the Quran? The response is the Sahaba were careful not to memorize the verses until they implemented it. So they were a bit fearful of just memorizing without acting and understanding. And this is reported by Ibn Mas'ud and others that we would, sorry, Ibn Abbas and others, that we would memorize only 10 verses and then we would understand them and act upon them, then memorize another. So the phenomenon of hivz that became common in the third, second, third generation 
and there's no problem with that and that's a great thing that we should do but in the earliest of generations there was a bit of a fear and may Allah Azza wa Jal protect us that the Quran ever be uh, a hujjah and evidence against us we ask Allah to make the Quran an evidence for us and not against us and a shafi' for us and not against us so the Sahaba were very scared about this and therefore only a few of them memorized the Quran this is the first interpretation of this hadith of Anas the second interpretation Yes, of course, others memorized, but four amongst them became the prominent and the uh, very authentic or very correct memory, okay? And we all know there are plenty of huffaz, but some of them, their hifd is perfect, and others, Allah must stand there like me. So, you know, we have the various levels that come. So, another interpretation is that uh, Ubayyah bin Ka'b was one of those who excelled and perfected the recitation of the Qur'an. And that is why uh, we have uh, a very famous hadith narrated uh, in the tertiary books of hadith. Arhamu ummati bi ummati Abi Bakr. The most merciful of my ummah to my ummah is Abu Bakr. Wa ashadduhum fi deenillahi Umar. And the strictest in the religion of Allah is Umar. Wa astaquhum hayaan Uthman. And the one who has perfected haya the most is Uthman. Wa a'lamuhum bil halali wal haram. Who? Guys, I just did this last week. Mu'adh ibn Jabal. Wa'alabuhum bil halali wal haram. Mu'adh ibn Jabal. We did this last week. Mu'adh ibn Jabal. We mentioned this. That the Prophet said, A'lamu bil halali wal haram. Wa'akra'u. Oh, oh, sorry, the next one is the one who knows the most inheritance. Afraduhum. Zayd ibn Thabit. Wa'akra'uhum. And the one who has the best qira'a. Now the qira'a here does not necessarily mean the best voice. That's not what is intended by qira'a. Qira'a here means the one who has the most authentic recitation. The one who is reciting with the best tajweed, not necessarily with the most melodious voice because there's two separate things. Okay, You can have a good voice, but your tajweed can be mediocre, sometimes even bad. Allah has blessed you with the voice, but you haven't studied tajweed. And you can have very perfect tajweed, but your voice is mediocre. And there are so many qurra, and I studied with many of them. Their, their tajweed is flawless, and it is beautiful to listen to if you understand the art of tajweed. But for the average Muslim who doesn't know the art of tajweed, they're like, oh, this qad is average, he doesn't, look, doesn't, doesn't appreciate this. So when the hadith says, أَقْرَأُهُمْ It means the most perfect in the rules of recitation. They're doing the qira'ah the best. And therefore, Ubay ibn Ka'b, the Prophet has said, he is the one who is the most authentic in the recitation of the Qur'an. So where does Ubay become famous? In the recitation of the Qur'an. And therefore, most of the uh, isnads and ijazat that the Qur'anic reciters have, uh, you know there are ijazat of the Qur'an, I have mentioned this before, uh, that there is this phenomenon, and this is only for the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that uh, we have an uninterrupted, unbroken chain from our times until the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with regards to both Quran and Hadith. Okay, we know exactly where we got it from. And the Quran uh, uh, ijazat, they typically go back to four or five of the Sahaba, and the main one that they go back to is Ubay ibn Ka'b. And you all know that I also have an ijazah in the Quran. My ijazah in the Quran goes back also to Ubay ibn Ka'b. Okay, it goes through Ubay ibn Ka'b. Because Ubay became the main or one of the main sahaba who then taught the Quran and preserved it in the legacy of the next generation. So that is really his main point of uh, fame. And because of this, his association with the Qur'an became well known and there are a number of hadith that all of you have heard and should be aware of regarding Ubay ibn Ka'b. Of them is the famous hadith in Sahih Muslim. Uh, and it is um, one of the most famous, and I mentioned it in a khutbah and also in the Ramadan khatiras, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in the masjid and Ubay was sitting there. So he said, Ya Aba al-Munzir. And Abu al-Mundir is the kunya of Ubay ibn Ka'b. Ya Abu al-Mundir, ayyu kitabin fi, ayyu ayatin fi kitab Allahi ta'ala a'zam. Which ayah is 
the best ayah or the greatest ayah, a'zam, azim. Which ayah is the greatest ayah in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This hadith shows us, before we even answer it, that not all of the Quran is the same. Some of the Quran is more blessed than the other, even though all of the Quran is more blessed than anything we say. So compared to our speech, the Quran is infinitely superior, all of it. You cannot compare our speech to the Quran. There's a hadith in Tirmidhi. Fadlu kalam ta'ala ala kalam khalqihi ka fadlillahi ta'ala ala khalqihi. That the superiority of the speech of Allah over the speech of the creation is like the superiority of Allah over the creation. So the kalam of Allah, which is the Quran, is all of it infinitely better than us. But compared within each other, some segments of the Quran are more powerful, more emphatic, more blessed than other segments, even though all of them are blessed compared to us. So, which ayah is the most greatest and the most blessed? And the fact that the Prophet is asking Ubay this question demonstrates there is a trust he has for Ubay. Demonstrates, you know, you, 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 you trust the, the more, uh, you know, the top students. You want to see how much they know. So Ubay, in his modesty, he said, Allahu wa Rasuluhu a'lam. Allah and his messenger know best. He did not want to answer the question. He felt embarrassed. And again, this goes back to the humility of the Sahaba. It also goes back to uh, the fact that we should all be modest and humble, genuinely humble when it comes to knowledge, when it comes to that which we don't know. We should say Allah and His Messenger know best. Then the Prophet repeated the question exactly the same. Ya Abu Al-Mundir, ayyu ayat in kitab al-a'zam. The same point. So th he is repeating the question, meaning I'm not quizzing, I'm not asking you because I don't know. I'm asking you to see what you know. So by repeating the same question, Ubay is being told you have to answer. Give me your opinion. So, without a moment's hesitation, and this is truly amazing, Ubay said, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum. La ta'khuduhu sinatu wa nanum. And he recited Ayat al-Kursi. Without a moment's hesitation, which means even when the first question was asked, something pops in his head. But out of modesty, he covers it up. He goes, Allah and his messenger know best. He didn't have to think. Immediately, the ayah came to him. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum. And there are over 6,000 verses in the Quran. And Ubay is a hafiz. And the fada'il of Ayatul Kursi have not been mentioned right now because this is still new, right? It's not as if he's been taught this. He does not know. But in, instinctively, Allah Azza wa Jal blessed him. And yani Allah blessed him with that knowledge. He immediately recited Ayatul Kursi. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pushed him on the chest. And I mentioned before, this is the equivalent of us tapping each other on the back. In those days, they would push in the chest as a sign of like, wow, great job. He pushed him in the chest and he said, لِيَهْنِكَ الْعِلْمُ يَا أَبَا الْمُنْذِرِ That knowledge has been made blessed. So, هَنِيَ لَكَ بِالْعِلْمُ Like basically, uh, how blessed and fortunate is knowledge. It's both a statement and a dua together. The statement is that your chest has been opened to knowledge. And the dua is, may you be opened up for more knowledge. Like, blessed are you and knowledge. So, the Prophet Sallallahu explicitly linked the knowledge, especially of the Quran, with uh, Abu al-Munzir, and that is Ubay ibn Ka'b. And so this is one of the most famous hadith about Ubay ibn Ka'b. As if that weren't enough, there is an even more powerful hadith about Ubay ibn Ka'b and the Quran. And... We already mentioned that he is the most knowledgeable of the Quran. We already mentioned the hadith of Ayatul Kursi. And then we get to a third one. And that is that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu called for Ubay ibn Ka'b. Or in one version, he visited the house of Ubay ibn Ka'b. Either one, either this or that. And then he said, O oh, Ubay, Allah has commanded me to recite the Quran to you. Ubay said, Awa sammani rabbi. My Lord has mentioned my name. In another version, Allahu dhakarani. Allah has mentioned me by name. And the Prophet sallallahu said, Naam, yes. So Ubay began to cry. 
because of the fact that Allah Azza wa had mentioned him by name. And then in some versions it is mentioned that the Prophet recited Surat al bayyina Surat al bayyina So the point is that uh, there is no Sahabi that we know of that this blessing has taken place. Allah has commanded me to recite the Quran to you. This is a blessing that is unique in the entire group of the Sahaba. And as I have said many times, each of the Sahaba has a particular blessing that others do not have. This is very common. And yes, the greatest of them overall is Abu Bakr, and then Umar, then Uthman, then Ali, no doubt. But still, even in that hierarchy, certain Sahaba have a specific privilege even above all of them. And Ubay ibn Ka'ab was even more knowledgeable than all of them when it came to the recitation of the Quran. Aqra'uhum li kitabillah. He was the one who had the most knowledge of the uh, Quran. And Ubay ibn Ka'ab participated in all of the battles without exception. And after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he spent the remaining years of his life simply teaching the Quran and narrating a hadith in the masjid. He spent his entire life teaching the Quran and narrating the hadith. And even though he participated in a few ghazawat, he dedicated his life to the Quran in the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he became the primary Quran teacher for the city of Medina in the decade following the death of the Prophet He was only alive for 10 years after the death of the Prophet So that's why another reason we don't have that much information about him and not that many hadith as we're gonna come to. He only narrated 80 hadith, which is not a small number, but it's not a large number either. He's not like Anas bin Malik or others. He only lived 10 years. And most of the narrators from him, by the way, are also other Sahaba because there's only a 10-year gap. So the younger Sahaba become his students. And the greatest Mufassir ever was who? Of the Sahaba. Ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas becomes his student. So Ubay ibn Ka'ab becomes the teacher of Ibn Abbas. And Ibn Abbas is going to become the greatest scholar of tafsir. But of course, Ibn Abbas is a young kid now. He's a teenager. He will become the greatest scholar, you know, in the year 60, 70 Hijrah. I mean, at that time, right now, we're still in the year 12, 13 Hijrah. So Ibn Abbas becomes a student of all of the Sahaba, but Ubay ibn Ka'ab becomes one of his main teachers. As well, the other uh, Sahaba who became famous in Quran, uh, and also the Tabi'un who became famous in Quran, they studied with Ubay ibn Ka'ab, such as Zid ibn Hubaysh, uh, and also our Qira'a of, uh, of Asim, the, the advanced students should know, we recite Hafs and Asim, and the Qira of Asim, which is our recitation of the Quran, you know the Quran has many, 10 recitations, uh, our Qira of Hafs and Asim, it goes back to Ubay ibn Ka'b, that's why my Ijaz also goes through Hafs, through Asim, through Ubay ibn Ka'b. Uh, so after the death of the Prophet he uh, began teaching the Quran in Medina, and um, he would tell his students that I finish the Quran every eight days, it was his Sunnah, Every eight days he would finish the Quran. So on average, how many Jews a day would he recite? About three and a half. Every single day he would recite three and a half Jews without exception till he uh, died. And uh, Ubay ibn Ka'b also was a very uh, humble man and he did not uh, talk beyond necessary or beyond need. It is said once that a man came and asked a question about something, is it halal or haram? He said to the man, this question you asked, has it occurred? The man said, no, it's just a theoretical one. So he said, then let it be. When it occurs, come and ask, and then I'll see if I can do ijtihad. He didn't want to give any theoretical responses. It is also narrated that once uh, the Prophet Sallallahu was asked about diseases, about sicknesses. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, they are kafarat for your sins. They forgive the sins. So Ubay asked, Ya Rasulullah, even if it's a small disease, the Prophet said, even a thorn that pricks will cause sins to be forgiven. So Ubay then made a dua to Allah. He said, Oh Allah, allow me to be sick until I die. But let not the sickness affect my hajj or my umrah or my salawat in the masjid or my jihad fi sabilillah. So he fell sick with a fever such that any time somebody would touch his body, it would be hot. But come time for the salah, and the adhan was called, his fever would go away, he would be able to come and pray, and then go back to his house, and there would be a fever again. 
come time for the Hajj season, he would be able to go for Hajj and come back. And he participated in, in a few ghazawat, not that many, because he was more concerned with the Quran and whatnot. So his dua was answered that Allah Azza wa Jal uh, gave him a, in, an illness, even though this was his ijtihad. Uh, for us who don't have that level of iman, we don't ask Allah to inflict us with illness. We ask Allah for his afiyah. We ask Allah to avert away all sicknesses and pain and suffering. Uh, as the hadith says, ask Allah for afiyah. And afiyah is the absence of calamity. Afiyah is the absence of pain and suffering. And it is a dua that our Prophet ﷺ commanded his uncle Abbas. Abbas said, Ya Rasulullah, what dua should I make? So the Prophet said, ask Allah for afiyah. Abbas said, I want more than this. The Prophet ﷺ said, ask Allah for afiyah. Abbas said, I want more than this. The Prophet ﷺ said, oh Abbas, ask Allah for afiyah for there's nothing better than afiyah. Afiyah means you're protected, khalas. You don't have any problems, no pain in this world or the next. Ask Allah for afiyah. So that's why we ask Allah. Allahumma inna nasaluk al afwa wal muafa fi din wa dunya. Allahumma inna nasaluk al afiyah. These are the terms that are used for this concept. Point being, don't misunderstand. Hubay radiyallahu an, he had his own ishtihad, and his point was, let me get rid of my sins in this world, so I can be raised up in the highest in the akhirah. He had that level of iman. As for us, we just ask Allah to avert any, uh, any calamity from us. Uh, during the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, Umar would respect him immensely. And Umar would say on the mimbar, this is narrated in the books of history, that he gave a khutbah once and he said, whoever has a question about the Quran, let him go to Ubayya bin Ka'b. Whoever has a question about fiqh, let him go to Mu'adh ibn Jabal. And whoever has a question about administrative money and how it's spent, let him come to me. Okay, I'm in charge of how the money is spent in the Ummah, okay? But Quran and Fiqh, you can go to those Sahaba. And uh, when uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab, the famous narration, all of you know, we go over it all the time, about the Salat al-Taraweeh, that Umar ibn al-Khattab, uh, one day he exited the, his house in the month of Ramadan, and he found groups of people praying in the masjid, helter-skelter, okay? One group there, another group there, another group there. Each one just coming together and just organically, they're just having two, three, you know, friends, whatnot of the Sahaba and Tabi'un, and they just have their own, uh, you know, salah, nafid, tahajjud. So Umar ibn Khattab said, why don't we combine all of these under one imam? So he then announced, from tomorrow, there will be one jama'ah. This is the Taraweeh prayer, okay? From tomorrow, there'll be one jama'ah. And who did he appoint to be the qari of the Sahaba in Taraweeh? What an amazing honor, right? We are here trying to find the qari every month who's going to come, what not. And imagine the qari of Medina, the first Taraweeh salah of Ramadan. This is the second year of Umar's reign, okay? In the time of Abu Bakr, it was the same. I've mentioned this many times. The Prophet, um, he didn't command taraweeh. What happened was he was simply praying in the masjid in the nights of Ramadan and one of the nights the Sahaba just saw him and they lined up behind him. Then the news spread the next day. So the next day without the process of announcing the masjid was packed. So he led them in taraweeh. They didn't call it taraweeh. He just led them into hajjud. They were there. Then the third day he did not come out and they waited till fajr and he did not come out. Then he said I knew you were outside, but I was worried if we continue doing this, it might become fard on you, and I didn't want to do that. So the Prophet, and that was the last year of his life, so the Prophet ﷺ intentionally did not come out on the third night, so that in the time of Abu Bakr, they didn't do anything. In the time of Umar, one, one and a half years, so there was only one Ramadan in the time of Abu Bakr. In the time of Umar, either the first or the second Ramadan of his reign, so that is when Salat al-Taraweeh was instituted, and Ubay ibn Ka'ab was the Qari who led them uh, we don't want to get into the 8 or 20 debates. He led them in, in, in one version. It says 8 rak'ah. Another version says 20 rak'ah. So Allah knows best. We have both of them narrated. Uh, but it seems Ubay did lead them uh, in 20 rak'ah. There, it does seem there is some narration. Nonetheless, another scholar says, no, it's only 8 rak'ah. So the issue of 8 and 20 goes back to this early era as well. And you know my position. It's trivial. Both are allowed in Islam. If you want to do eight, you may do eight. If you want to do 20, you may do 20. It is allowed in Islam. So the point is, uh, Ubay was chosen as the Imam 
of the Ramadan salawat of Taraweeh. It is also narrated in the Tabaqat of Ibn Sa'd that Ubayy ibn Ka'b uh, uh, asked Umar ibn al-Khattab, O Amir al-Mu'mineen, why don't you appoint me like you appointed the rest of the Sahaba? Like he felt something, like am I doing something wrong? You're assigning positions of, i.e. there's government roles, there's jobs that are being given. Why aren't you using me as the other people that are of our batch, our group, what not? And look at the beautiful response of Umar. Umar ibn al-Khattab said, I don't wish to corrupt your religion. You're too pure for politics. Stay away from this. I want to keep you pure. I don't wish to corrupt. You're too, basically, he's saying you're too high. You're too holy. I don't want you to come involved and then this happens, that happens. People are going to say this and that. Stay out of it. You are too good to get involved in politics. So, I don't want to make your deen yani, you know, corrupted by uh, the issue of politics. So, Ubay never held political office because Umar ibn Khattab held him in too high of a regard. Uh, Ibn Sa'ad also narrates that a man came from Iraq to ask Umar some questions. And he sat in the masjid of Umar. And next to Umar on the right-hand side was an old man, fully white hair. So we learn now that Ubay ibn Ka'b has absolutely white hair. He did not dye his hair till he died. Absolutely white beard, white hair in a clean garment. And Umar would look at him with respect. And the man said during the course of the conversation, uh, he said that this world is only our provisions and the ride until the next world. And it is the next world that will face the consequences of our actions. When the man stood up and left, basically it's a statement of truth. This world is just our markab, our ride. We have to wait to get to the next and that's our real life. When the man stood up and left, this Iraqi asked Umar ibn al-Khattab, who was that man? So Umar ibn al-Khattab said, هذا سيد المسلمين هذا أبي ابن كعب. So Umar, who is the Amir al-Mu'minin, is saying this is the leader of the Muslims. سيد المسلمين. This is Ubay ibn Kaab. Ubay ibn Kaab passed away most likely in the year 22 AH. Some say in the year 30 AH. But the point is that he died a relatively early death. He did not see the fitna of the Sahaba. He did not live to the later generations. And when he died, and he's buried in Baqi' al-Gharqad, when he died, uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab said, today the Sayyid al-Muslimin has died, to the leader of the Muslims has died. That is all that we know about Ubay ibn Ka'b, a very little amount. Oh, he had um, four or maybe five children. Uh, and so his nasab or his lineage does remain uh, to this day. Uh, but um, we don't have much information about uh, um, the, the time of his birth, and we also don't have much information about other things that took place pre-Islam, because again, who's going to record those things? So this is all that I was able to get to you, but what we do have are a lot of ahadith, and most of them are related to the Quran, not surprisingly. So even the ahadith that Ubay is narrating are related to the Quran. And as you know, I choose the Musnad of Imam Ahmad. All of you by now should know this book, and the reason I choose it is because Firstly, it is the most um, uh, comprehensive of all books of hadith that we have. There is no book that is larger than this book, over 40, 50,000 or 40 something thousand of hadith. No book has anything similar to this in our times. And secondly, it's arranged according to the Sahaba, not according to the topic, which is why uh, not many people read it because it's not topically arranged. You yourself will see today, we're just going through a hadith that sounds random. Actually, it's not quite random because it's arranged according to the Isnad. But the topic-wise is random. So one hadith is about Tahara, other hadith is about Quran, other hadith about... So this is what's going to be happening, and that's you, but you know this by now about uh, Ubay ibn Ka'b. Uh, now, some topics are going to be raised in these hadith are a little bit advanced, and I do need to bring them up because, again, this is the knowledge of our religion. Ibn Abbas narrated, that Umar ibn al-Khattab gave a khutbah upon the member of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, Aliyun aqdana wa ubayyun aqra'una. As I just said, this is Muslim by Muhammad. Ali is the one who has the best qada amongst us. In another version, it's Mu'ad. Or maybe it was two different ones. Allah knows best. Aliyun aqdana wa ubay aqra'una. And sometimes we don't narrate from ubay 
even though Ubay heard from the Prophet وسلم, because the Prophet وسلم, was revealed the kitab as well after Ubay. You know, this sounds very cryptic. What is going on here? I'll explain. One of the most controversial and misunderstood topics is the concept of abrogation in the Quran. Nasq, the concept of abrogation. And the concept of abrogation is mentioned in the Quran and in the Sunnah. In the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, Allah says, مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِهَا نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا We never abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten except that we bring something similar or better than it. This is explicit in the Quran. So this opens up the door which many Muslims don't know about. And again, if we lived in an ideal world, maybe the average Muslim shouldn't know about it until they become advanced students, but we don't. It's better you hear it from me than you hear it from somebody who's going to cause doubts in your hearts. Yes, the concept of abrogation is correct. And there were verses revealed that are no longer a part of our Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lifted it up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abrogated it. And Umar is now saying that some things Ubay says or, or recites, we don't recite them because we know they have been abrogated. And Ubay heard it from the Prophet sallam, so he thinks they're still being able to be recited. Okay? And we will come across some of these narrations that Ubay had certain... Uh, verses of the Qur'an that he would recite. And remember, this is before the compilation of, by whom? Uthman ibn Affan. This is a key point here, right? Because Uthman ibn Affan solidified. Uthman ibn Affan made the Qur'an standardized. And that's why to this day we call this Mus'haf, Mus'haf of Uthman, right? The Uthmanic Mus'haf. Because Uthman, so Ubay is pre-Uthman. And there were there was ambiguity amongst the Sahaba. What is to be done with those abrogated verses? Because in the end of the day, that's what he's saying. And Ubay heard it from the Prophet ﷺ, but we know that after he heard it, it had been abrogated. So Umar is saying, look, what Ubay is reciting in those sections, we know it's there. It's correct. It was there, but we don't recite it. I'm not going to recite it because I know that it had been abrogated. And Ubay felt that if I heard it from the Prophet ﷺ, then I have the right to recite it, okay? Then Uthman came 10 years later and said, from now on, those abrogated verses will not be recited. And he made the Quran into this compilation, and it is the Quran that we have it to this day. So this is Ubay ibn Ka'b. And uh, another uh, hadith of Ubay, which will bring us another topic of Quran. So notice, we're going to be doing quite a lot of the sciences of the Quran when it comes to Ubay ibn Ka'b. Uh, that uh, Ubadah ibn al-Samid said that Ubay ibn Ka'b said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Unzil al-Qur'anu ala sab'ati ahruf This is a famous mutawatir hadith The Qur'an has been revealed in seven tongues Okay, sab'ati ahruf What is this? Well, let's, look at the, let's look at the next hadith Ubay ibn Ka'b said The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught me a verse in one way and I heard it being recited by another person in a different way. So I went up to him and I said, who taught you this? So he said, the Prophet Sallallahu taught it to me. So I said, Wallahi, I have memorized it from the Prophet Sallallahu myself. And then Ubay says, and listen to this, never had a doubt about Islam crept into my heart like it had at this point in time. Like what is going on? Two different verses. Or similar but not the same. So I went to the Prophet وسلم, right then and there. And I said to him, Ya Rasulullah, didn't you teach me this ayah in such and such a manner? He said, yes. Then he said, but I just heard so and so recited in such and such a manner. So the Prophet وسلم, hit me in the chest and all the doubts that I had went away. Just by touching the Prophet all that went away. And then he said, the Prophet ﷺ said, Jibra'il and Mika'il came to me. And Jibra'il said, Iqra al Quran ala harf. Read the Quran in one way. Mika'il said to me, Ask for more. So I said, 
allow me to do two. Mikael continued to tell me to ask Jibreel more and more and more until I reached seven. Then he said, the Prophet said, Kulluha shafin kafin. All of them are pure and complete. Okay? So this gets us to the very, very problematic and uh, difficult topic of the seven dialects or the seven ahruf of the Quran. It is one of the most confusing topics when you read the sciences of the Quran. It really boggles the mind. And if Ubay ibn Ka'ab felt a doubt, how about me and you? Hmm? If Ubay ibn Ka'ab said, I have never in my life felt a doubt as I did when I found out another Sahabi reciting in a different way, and then we don't have the luxury of the process of tapping us on the shoulders. We don't have that luxury. So we have to have a leap of faith. And in summary, and we were going to come to this, um, that these ahruf were revealed in early Islam to make it easy for all of these different Arab tribes to memorize the Quran. And they had differences in their wording. They had synonyms being replaced. They had pronunciation differences. Some of those differences remain in our qiraat of our times. This causes even more confusion. Okay, So understand there are two concepts. Number one, the qiraat. And number two, the ahruf. Okay, there are many qiraats that are present. The ahruf are not present. We have books of the qiraat. We can touch them. We can feel them. We can log on to YouTube and listen to the qiraat of Hafs al Asim, the qiraat of Shu'ba, the qiraat of Warsh, the qiraat of Qalun. We can listen to the ten qiraat. If you ever listen to Abdul Basit Abdul Samad, sometimes he goes into his mashallah tabarakallah zone, right? Wadduha, wadduha, wadduha. These are qiraat, okay? Wallayli uh, da'a, so you can listen to that, right? Maliki yawmiddin, maliki yawmiddin, right? Alayhimu, uh, alayhim. He goes and you, you can hear the same verse. These are qiraat, these are sciences that are studied, memorized. You can memorize the qiraat and they are tangible. You feel them, they're here. And the differences between them are relatively trivial. Pronunciation, what not. The ahruf. The problem is we don't have them anymore. They're not in books. They're not tangible. We just have references in these types of books. So the question is, what then are the ahruf and how do they relate to the qiraat? Is that you understand the point here? Okay. And the topic or the answer to this can quite literally take us many, many months and weeks and years of study. And it is still being discussed to be very, very simplistic. Umar, sorry, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala an understood that the need for the differences of the qiraat no longer exists. And in his time, some dispute started about the different ahruf of the Quran. And he realized that if we allow these differences to remain, it's going to cause problems. So he called all of the sahaba and they agreed to eliminate all of the variations other than the primary Qurashi dialect variation. Most likely these variations dealt with tribal differences. Because realize that each tribe had different pronunciation, each tribe had different, so even now in the age of globalization, in the age of the internet, in the age of mass media and Hollywood, even now, People in America speak English differently than people in Australia or people in England. And they have different words for the same thing. Okay? I can give you many examples. I go to England all the time and some of them are pretty funny. Uh, you want to vacuum in England, you don't say vacuum. You say, what do the Brits call vacuuming? Anybody? Very good. Hoovering. <laughs> Why? Because the vacuum cleaner was introduced as the Hoover brand. So literally to this day, the Brits say, I have to hoover my room. There's vacuum. Point I'm giving, I can give you a million one examples, right? Push chair is a tram. Okay, push chair, the baby, the tram. It's called a push chair. No, 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 not rather push chair. It's called a push chair. So they have all of these differences. They make fun of us, we make fun of them as the reality. Point being, go back a thousand years, English in various parts of the world is even more different than it is now. You see my point here, right? German, 500 years ago, in various parts of Germany was different. So the point being, 1,400 years ago, 
the Arabs of Arabia spoke Arabic differently. North Arab, South Arab, the tribe of Hudayl, the tribe of Qatil, the tribe of the Banu Kilab, the tribe of Kinda, the tribe of Quraysh. So most likely, and we're not 100% sure, it looks like to be the case, these Ahruf essentially simplified the memorization of the Quran in accordance with the primary regional dialects of the Arabic language. Is that clear? That seems to be the case, that these Ahruf dealt with those dialects. Uthman radiallahu anh, understood that, look, the purpose now is gone. We are now a literate nation. We are reading and writing. And these differences are going to cause more harm than good. So that is why he came together and he formed a committee or a team. And Ubay is not there. He's before this, right? He's in the time of Umar. And he then agreed to basically get rid of all of these variations and put the Quran in one simple book. And that's the one that we have right now. So uh, that is the purpose of the seven Ahruf. And Ubay would recite those Ahruf and Ubay also would recite abrogated verses. So it's both of them because Ubay is going back to hearing from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam directly. Uh, this next hadith on Ubay ibn Ka'ab, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, should I not teach you a surah that is neither in the Torah or the Zabur or the Injil or even in the Quran something similar to this surah? Ubay said, yes. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, so I will not leave the masjid from that door until I teach you that surah. Then the Prophet began to pray. And I prayed with him. When he turned to leave and he was about to exit from the door, I held on to his hand and I said, Ya Rasulullah, the surah you said you're going to teach me. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, what do you recite when you stand up to pray? So I said, the Fatiha tul Kitab. So he said, Hiya he. That is the surah I'm talking about. Wahiya Sab'ul Mathani wal Quranul Azim alladhi uti tu ba'du. And it is the Sab'ul Mathani. What is the Sab'ul Mathani? It's in the Quran. Walaqad ataynaka Sab'am min al Mathani wal Quran al Azim. We have given you the seven oft repeated verses and we've given you the Quran. So Allah says, We've given you the seven oft repeated verses and we've given you the Quran. So it is as if the Fatiha has been made equivalent to the Qur'an. And our Prophet ﷺ said the Fatiha is neither in the Torah, nor the Zabur, nor the Injil. And a few years ago in my Ramadan series, I had tafsir of the Fatiha and I quoted this hadith over there. Uh, the next hadith that we're going to do, as usual, time always catches us. I'm going to choose that one. Uh, the next hadith that we're going to do. Ibn Abbas said that he had a argument with another tabi'i about who was the companion of Moses, Musa in the Quran that he met. Ibn Abbas said it is Khadr and the other person said it is somebody else. And while they were debating, Ubay ibn Ka'ab passed by them. And Ibn Abbas is the main student of Ubay. So Ibn Abbas called out to Ubay, come here. So Ubay came. Ibn Abbas said, I had an argument with this person here regarding who is the person that Musa met in the Quran. So did you hear anything from the Prophet Sallallahu about that? So Ubay said, yes. I heard the Prophet Sallallahu say, once Musa was in a gathering of the children of Israel, when a man stood up and said, is there anybody more knowledgeable than you, O Musa? And Musa said, no. So Allah revealed to him, there is a person more knowledgeable, and that is our servant Khadr. So Musa then asked Allah, how can I find him? So Allah Azza wa Jal made the fish a sign for him. And he said, wherever you miss the fish, that is where you're going to find the, where the, the fish goes missing. That's where you're going to find Khadr. And therefore, they went on the journey, and Musa said to his servant, this is in the Quran. This is all in the Quran, Surah Al Kahf, that give us our food. We are very tired of this journey. And at that point in time, they discovered that the fish was no longer there. They returned on their way until they found the, uh, uh, the, uh, the person Khidr. And then what Allah said in the Quran happened. So here we have an interesting story that. Uh, Ubay ibn Ka'ab has heard that it is exactly Khidr or Khadr uh, that the, the Quran came down regarding. 
Uh, next hadith that we're going to do. Ibn Abbas said that Ubay ibn Ka'b said to Umar ibn Khattab, O Amir al Mu'mineen, I have learned the Quran from the same person you have learned from. And I learned it from him when Jibreel revealed it fresh. It's still wet, it's still fresh. And this took place when Umar said that I'm not going to take these verses that you're reciting. Remember, we talked about those abrogated verses. So Ubay felt a little bit like hurt. He said to Umar al Khattab that I learned the Quran from the same person as you did. Means there's nobody between me and the Prophet. And I learned it directly when Jibreel came down. Why? Because he's the one who wrote it down. He's the katib of the wahi. He's the first person to have heard the uh, verses. So he feels a sense of, well, that's not fair. I mean, I know these verses, so why shouldn't I recite them? And as I had already mentioned, that that was his ijtihad. And uh, Uthman, uh, sorry, Umar disagreed. And then Uthman made it official policy. Uthman made official policy that those abrogated verses will no longer be recited. Uh, Ubay ibn Ka'b narrated that the Prophet sallallahu said, the child that Khadr killed, the day he was born, he was stamped as a kafir. And if he had lived, he would have tortured his parents with tughyan and kufr. He would have caused his parents much grief with his transgression and his kufr. This is a hadith that once again goes back to the tafsir of Surah Al Kahf. You all know the story when Khadr kills the child, right? And then Musa says, How dare you kill him? And in the end, Khadr says that Allah knew that if the child grew up, he would hurt his parents with Tughyan and Kufr. So this hadith says, this is a hadith in the process from Ubay, the day that the child of Khadr, the, that, that Khadr killed, was born, the day that that child was born, he was stamped with Kufr, meaning this is Qadr of Allah. It was already pre-decreed. And there's nothing that could have done to change that. And had he lived, he would have caused his parents much uh, grief and distress. Ubay ibn Ka'b said that when Jibreel, and this is uh, uh, coming from him, the Prophet did not say this right now. He's going to quote the Prophet at the end. When Jibreel hit his foot to start the flow of Zamzam, you all remember the story? of uh, Hajar, that when she was crying, Jibreel came and uh, he hit his foot. This Ubayy is saying he hit his foot. In another version, it says he hit his wing. Point is, he hit something. The water began to spread out. And Umm Ismail blocked up the water. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Rahimallahu Hajar Umm Ismail لو تركتها لكانت مائعا معينا. May Allah have mercy on Hajar, the mother of Ismail. If only she had left Zamzam, it would have been a lake. Rather than a well, it would have been a lake. Okay, it would have been basically a cistern, a pool. It wouldn't have just been a well. And the fact, the reason that she, oh, sorry, the 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 fact that her, her, of her covering it up is what made it into a well. And I have gone over the story in my seerah as well, way before this, that in her language, zam meant stop or enough. So she said, zam, zam, stop, stop. She, did, she didn't want the water to flow out. She was worried that there wasn't enough water for Ismail. So she didn't want it to run away. So she blocked the water so that there would be enough for Ismail. And she did not know that this would be the most blessed source of water in all of human history, and it would fe feed hundreds of millions of people from the time of Ibrahim up until Judgment Day non-stop. She did not know that, so she wanted to save it only for her son Ismail, so she blocked it. And that's where we get this Zamzam from. And our Prophet said, may Allah have mercy on her. If only she let it flow, it would be a full, uh, a full pool. Ubay ibn Ka'b narrated, that the Prophet وسلم, said, Allah has commanded me to recite the Quran to you. I said, Wasamani Laka Rabbi, my Lord mentioned my name to you. And Ubay then recited, Qul bi fadlillahi wa bi rahmatihi fa bi This is in the Quran. Surah Yunus, verse 58. 
Say, rejoice at the rahmah of Allah and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, this is an ayah that is in the Quran and obey when he's narrating his, to his students what happened, he is quoting this ayah. In the next version, it mentions that Ubay began to um, cry uh, with, when he found this out. Ubay ibn Ka'ab said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, do not curse the wind when it comes to you because the wind is from the spirit of Allah or the help of Allah. When a wind comes, ask Allah for its good and the good that it brings and the good because of which has, it has been sent and seek refuge in Allah from its evil and the evil that is in it and the evil for which it has been sent. This hadith is a fundamental hadith. We do not curse any of Allah's creation and any of the incidents of this world. We don't curse the natural phenomena. And this is one of the fundamental hadith of this regard. If there's bad weather, if there's anything, even a, thund a, th a thunder hurricane, something like this, we do not curse it because it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is some good in it as well. All winds have some good in it. So when the wind comes, Ubay ibn Ka'ab said, don't curse the wind. Rather, ask Allah for its good and seek refuge from Allah from its evil. Ubay ibn Ka'ab narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed Fajr and he forgot an ayah. And when the salah finished, Ubay said, Ya Rasulullah, has this ayah been lifted up or did you just forget? Who could say this other than Ubay? Nobody else could ask this question other than Ubay. So the Prophet sallallahu said, and he reminded of the ayah, the Prophet said, no, I just forgot it. Okay, this shows that even the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam makes the human mistakes that all qaris make, and it is done for the wisdom to teach us what to do when the qari makes a mistake in the salah. Okay, in one version, not in this one. In another version, when the Prophet sallallahu got stuck, nobody. This is the first time this happened. Nobody said anything and he just stopped and then he went into ruku. then he turned around and he said where is Ubay Ubay said I'm here Ya Rasulullah so he said why didn't you remind me when I was stuck so Ubay ibn Ka'b was the one immediately the Prophet said why didn't you I didn't know what was next why didn't you of course I love this hadith because I get stuck all the time so I say okay alhamdulillah it's sunnah to get stuck once in a while uh, it's not and this is of the mercy of Allah because this shows us, imagine if this hadith didn't happen, what would we do, right? So there's a wisdom in the Prophet himself. You know, every qari, he just doesn't remember the next ayah. So even our Prophet this happened, and Ubay was the one who uh, was asked by the Prophet why didn't you tell me? Ubay ibn Ka'ab said that the Prophet in Salat al-Witr, he would recite. What are the three surahs we recite in Salat al-Witr, guys? Sabbihi sabi rabbika al-a'la. Kafirun and ikhlas. This hadith is right here in front of you. Now you know why usually in the witr of the taraweeh we recite sabbih isma rabbika al-a'la and then kafirun and ikhlas. It's right here in this hadith in Muslim Bamha. Ubay ibn Ka'ab said that in the salat al witr the Prophet will recite sabbih isma rabbika al-a'la and then qul ya ayyul kafirun and then qul huwa allahu ahad. Uh, and that is the sunnah that uh, people follow to this day. Uh, Ubay ibn Ka'ab said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna min ash-shi'ari la hikama. Verily, some of poetry has wisdom in it. Verily, some of poetry has wisdom in it. And this is a famous hadith reported in Sahih Bukhari as well. And this shows us that poetry in and of itself is not haram. Our Prophet sallallahu is saying, some of poetry has wisdom in it. And therefore, if the poetry is good, and it has a good message, and there's nothing haram associated with it, then it is good. And if the poetry is haram, or the content is vulgar, or it is associated with vulgarities, then it becomes haram. Suwayd ibn Ghafla said that I went on an expedition with, and he mentioned their names, they're all tabi'un, and we found a whip on the road. So I took it. My two companions said, you're not allowed to take it, get rid of it. But I said, no. I will take it and I'll announce it. If anybody has lost it, it's his. Otherwise, I will keep the whip. The both of them said it is not allowed. And I said it is allowed. When we came 
after Hajj, we then went to Medina and we met Ubay ibn Ka'ab and all of us told him what happened and said, who is correct? So you understand the story. What is to be done when you find a lost item? Okay. This tabi'i said, I'm going to use it. It's on the road. It's literally on the floor, meaning in the middle of the desert, right? They're walking there. Why can't I take it? And the other two said, no, you should leave it there. So now they get to Medina and they ask Ubay ibn Ka'ab, who was right? Ubay said, during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I found a money bag with 100 dinars. So I came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I asked him, what should I do? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, announce it for one year. So I announced it, but nobody came to claim it. Then I came to him again and he said to me three times, the narrator is saying, I don't know whether that was three times in one year or one time for three years. The narrator below, Ubay. So we're, we're not sure. It was three years, three times in one year or one time every year. And I did it three times. Then the fourth time the Prophet wasallam said, memorize the quantity of coins and the type of bag it is in. And if somebody comes to claim it, return it, otherwise you may use it. This is the fiqh of, the Arabic term is luqata. And the luqata means a lost item, okay? So, if you find a lost item in the street, you have the option of leaving it there. You have the option, and this is what we're talking about a lost item that is standard, like uh, our scholars say, that which is, you know, uh, usable by everybody, not which is specific. So obviously a person's iPhone is specific, okay? We're talking about a pen, hmm? something like, or a dollar, like that's anybody, or even a hundred dollars, you find the hundred dollar bill just lying, you know? Now you have a number of options, I'm going into a little bit of fiqh here. Uh, the, the, the best thing to do if it is a closed environment and there is an authority there, you hand it over and say somebody lost this and announce it. That is the ideal thing to do. But if it's not a, so for example, in a university, you will go to the lost and found, for example. And when there's a system in place, you do that. But what if you find it in the middle of the desert, which is these hadith here, okay? What if you find it, there is no, I mean, you know, there is no authority to, and, or what if it's a trivial thing, like a whip is not the most expensive item. It's like, it's finding a pen that's an average pen. Can you just pick it up and take it? So from this hadith we learn that you go to the places that are known and if it's of some value, if it's a cheap pen, you could just ignore it. But if it's of some value, you should make a genuine attempt to announce that I have a pen, if anybody lost it, I have a wallet, I have found some money, but don't give too many details. Okay, so for example, let's be realistic. You find a $20 bill right outside MIC, mashallah, tabarak. Okay, it has happened many, many, many times. You find a $20 bill, or even let's make it juicier, a $100 bill. Okay, you find it in the parking lot. Ideally speaking, okay, you hand it in and you say, and you give it over to our brother Rusli. You say, khalas, take this. Theoretically, you are allowed to make an announcement a few times that uh, now this announcement should not be done inside the musalla because there are hadith don't, don't make the musalla into that. But you may make the announcement. Some money has been lost. Has anybody lost money? You don't say how much because unscrupulous people will come and say, oh, that's mine. Or there is a missing wallet. Then the person is supposed to come and that's what the hadith says. Memorize the strings on the bag. That's what the hadith says. So the person will not come and say, oh, I lost a bag that looks like this, 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 this. And if he describes the bag accurately, it is his. If he describes the pen, it is his. Suppose he doesn't come back after a period of time and it's a good quantity of money. So the hadith says one year. Uh, so then after that year, you may take that money and use it. But any time in the future, a person comes and says, oh, I lost my wallet. It had $5,000 in it. And you, mashallah, upgraded your car. 
then you are responsible to pay back that 5,000. Is that clear? This is our fiqh. Okay, and this is what the hadith says. That you may use something of value if there's nobody else that you know, you know that has it. But, as the Prophet said, if the owner comes back, then you have to give it back to him. Or it's equivalent. Now, obviously, if it's gone, you've already upgraded your car, you have to give it back to the equivalent. Or you use the pen, and it was a decent pen or whatnot. You know, there are pens that are worth, you know, good amounts of money, whatever. I'm just giving an example. Then you have to uh, pay the owner the equivalent back because you did utilize it. So you take it at a risk. You take it at a uh, risk. Um, time is up. Let's just do one or two more hadith and we're done. This is a very interesting hadith. Ubayy ibn Ka'b said, I was with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when a Bedouin came and said, O Messenger of Allah, I have a brother with a disease. The Prophet sallallahu said, what is his disease? The man said, he has been touched, meaning by a jinn, i.e. possessed. This is one of the very rare hadith that mentioned the concept of possession. Okay. And this is one of the most explicit ones as well. Bihi lamam. Lamam is uh, touching of the jinn. So the Prophet said, bring him to me. So the boy was brought in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Other versions say he had to be carried. He couldn't walk. He was just placed in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu sought protection for him through the Fatiha and through the last, uh, the first four verses of Surah Al-Baqarah uh, uh, and through Ilahukum Ilahum Wahid Surah Baqarah and through Ayat Al-Kursi and through the last three verses of Surah Baqarah and through the, the verse of Ali Imran, verse number 18, Shahid Allahu Annahu La Ilaha Illahu and the verse number 54 of Araf is going through every verse that the Prophet is reciting. Inna Rabbakum Allahu Ladi Khalaq as Samawati Al-Aud and through the last verses of Surah Al-Mu'minun and through Surah Al-Jinn and through the first 10 of Surah Safat, and through the last three of Surah Al-Hashr, and through Surah Al-Ikhlas, and Surah Falaq, and Surah Nas. Ubay had memorized every single verse that he used. And he's then telling us, these are the verses that need to be used. And when he finished reciting, the man or the boy stood up as if he had never been sick. So this is the asl or the, uh, how do we know that we're supposed to recite the Quran and perform exorcisms. I have given entire lectures, if I'm not mistaken, two or three lectures I gave about sihr and whatnot. This is one of those ahadith about exorcism and reciting over the possessed one until it is gone. Now, obviously, the Prophet's exorcism is the most powerful. And so one recitation and khalas is gone. For the rest of us, we have to struggle through many, many times. Uh, Ubay ibn Ka'b sa said that the, the Sahaba began talking about Laylatul Qadr. And so I said, I swear by the one besides whom there is no God, I know which Layla it is, which night it is. It is the night that the Prophet told us. It is the night of the 27th of Ramadan. So Ubay is swearing. And I gave many talks about at the Kursi and I mentioned Ubay would swear by Allah it is the 27th of Ramadan. They said, how do you know this? He said, because our Prophet told us the sign of Laylatul Qadr, that the sun will rise the next day pure and crystal clear without having any rays. Okay? So the narrator said, the narrator from Ubay, for the next three years, I would wake up every morning and wait for the sun to rise in Ramadan. And every single year after the 27th, it would rise crystal clear without its rays. So this is a hadith that, yes, we said so many times in Ramadan, I said that uh, the greatest candidate for the Laylatul Qadr is the 27th of Ramadan, and that is correct. However, we say that it cannot be for certain, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows for certain what day it is. Uh, some beautiful hadith, I want to do them, so just two, three more. Uh, Ubay ibn Ka'ab said that the mushrikeen, the pagans came to the Prophet and they said, O oh Muhammad, Tell us, what is the genealogy of your Lord? The genealogy, parents and whatnot. So because of this Allah revealed, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ 
Okay, so this is the famous Sabab uh, al-Nuzul. Why was Surah Al-Ikhlas revealed? That the pagans of Mecca came and asked about who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, we'll do two more then. I have some more in mind, but we'll just do two more. Uh, beautiful hadith here that uh, one of the tabi'un says, I came to Medina and I found an old man speaking in the masjid. I asked, who is this man? They said, it is Ubayy bin Ka'b. So of what I heard, this is a unique hadith. You will not find it by any other sahabi. It's a very unique hadith. Of what I heard was that he said, when Adam was about to die, he told his children, Oh, my children, I am desiring the fruits of Jannah. So go out and find for me some fruits from Jannah. So his children went out obeying their father. And they found the angels coming with the shrouds and the perfumes. And they had as well axes and shovels. So they said, O oh, children of Adam, literally children of Adam, where are you going? They said, our father is sick and he wants the fruits of Jannah. So they said, go back to your father for his decree has now come. Now pause here. They had never seen a burial. They had never seen that type of death. Now, uh, uh, Habid and Qabid, of course, they had, there's a murder done. But that murder, it was covered up by, how was the grave dug? It was just stone, the crow showed, and then the other brother fled. He didn't, so this is not known to the other children of Adam, okay? Uh, the Cain and Abel story is the first death of humanity. The first death was a murder. But a natural death has not yet occurred. And Adam shall be the first natural death ever. And so the children don't even know that he's about to die. And they just say that he's fallen sick. And they think he's delirious. And so he wants to get Jannah's fruit. They have heard from their father. And well, I just think about it. Just think how amazing it would have been to be of that family. Your parents are the only human beings. And they're telling you about this place called Jannah. I mean, just imagine that world and scenario. This is now what's happening. Okay. So they said, the angel said, Go back because the qada is come. This is it. So they all returned. When Hawa saw the angels, she recognized who they were and she cried out and jumped on Adam to protect him. Because Hawa understands what's going on. And now she is fearful of Adam's death. But Adam said, away from me. Now Allah's decree has come. And they took him and he died. They gave him the ghusl. They put the kafan on him. They perfumed him. It's all in the hadith here. They dug his grave and they made the lahd, which is, we talked about this in the fifth class, right? Which is the, uh, the, the, the inside chamber, right? You go down, then you go in, right? The L-shaped. And then they prayed salah, janazah over him. Then they put him in the qabr and they then covered up the lahd with labin, with bricks. And then they exited from the qabr and they covered up that hole with turab. And then they said, O oh, children of Adam, this shall be your sunnah from now on. Isn't this an amazing hadith? And you will only find it from Ubay bin Ka'b. So the beginnings of the story. Khalas, the time is up. Let's just do one or two of the end ones that I wanted to do. We skipped over nice someone's in the middle. La bas. But you see why I want to do this. It's so beautiful to go over the hadith of the Sahaba and it's an excuse for us to just listen to what our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. Uh, so Ubayy bin Ka'ab said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once recited in Salah and he forgot an ayah. So he turned around and he said, who memorized this surah from me? So Ubayy said, I did, Ya Rasulullah, and you forgot this and this ayah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I knew that if anybody had memorized it from me and would correct me, it is you. So here is the Prophet ﷺ praising Ubay in his knowledge of the Quran. And the last hadith that we will uh, do. 
the last hadith that we'll do. One day, Ubay said, one day, I was standing behind the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and it was the khutbah of Jum'ah. So he gave the khutbah. Then he recited uh, Surah Bara'a, Surah Bara'a, the ninth surah in the Quran. And next to me were standing Fulan and Fulan. And one of them poked me in the salah and said to me, Oh, Ubay, when was this surah revealed? Because I've never heard it until now. So I said to him, Be quiet. This is Ubay telling the other guy, Be quiet. And when the salah finished, he then asked me again. And Ubay said, Oh, so and so. Your whole salah has gone because you have spoken during it. So this must be somebody who didn't know the, uh, the, 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 the you know, etiquettes of salah. And so he went and complained. How dare he say my salah is gone. And the Prophet said, Sadaq Ubay, Ubay has spoken the truth. That you're not supposed to speak in the salah. So uh, the point being that even the sahaba, they knew the knowledge of Ubay ibn Ka'b. And so much so, while the Prophet is reciting, somebody pokes Ubay. And says, hey, when did this surah come down? I never heard this. First time I'm hearing this, right? And so uh, Ubay radiallahu an got angry and said, just be quiet, not now. And then the story happened, that story. So here we have a number of a hadith we recited. Uh, to summarize, Ubay ibn Ka'b, we don't have much information, just two and a half pages I have about Ubay ibn Ka'b. But he was aqra'uhum li kitabillah, the one who knew the Quran the most. And he was the one whom the Prophet ﷺ multiple times talked about the blessings of the Quran. And he was the only one whom Allah mentioned by name from above the seven heavens and said to the Prophet ﷺ, recite the Quran to Ubay ibn Ka'b. No other sahabi has that blessing. Uh, so we should remember and know his name, radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda. And inshallah with it we conclude for today's halaqa. And we'll continue next week, insha'Allah ta'ala. Any quick questions? Don't think so. Yeah, go ahead, Sina. Is it allowed to mix and match between the qira'at? The majority of scholars say no, uh, because it will confuse the masses. And so this is a valid opinion. The only time you may mix between the qira'at is when you are a specialist reciting to a specialist. What Abdul Basid and Manshawi, may Allah have mercy on them, used to do, it has been discouraged by many of our ulama because it does confuse the masses. If you haven't memorized the surah, or even if you have, and you hear Abdul Basid doing seven different you know, ways, like he does this, like he keeps on going so many different times, okay? If you don't know, even you forget. Is it hita, hita, huta? What is it? So if you hear so many of them, you get confused. So the more stricter scholars of qira'at, they say it should not be done unless in advance gatherings of students of knowledge and qura and whatnot. But it sounds very nice when Abdul Basit does it. So we enjoy it when he does it. And it's not haram to do that, but it's not wise to do that either. Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. Go ahead. Not in the one that we have, obviously not. That's the whole point. The evolution of verses. The prohibition of drinking is taqsis. Uh, it's not, it's not mansukh. Mansukh, um, there were a hadith I was going to quote you, but we didn't have time. Ubay recited, uh, and this is the most famous abrogated verse. Uh, if the son of Adam had a valley of gold, he would have wanted two. And if he had two, he would have wanted three. And nothing shall fill his stomach except turab, except dust. And Allah will repent upon the one who repents. This used to be an ayah of the Quran. Now it is a hadith. And it is a hadith in Bukhari. And it's hadith for a wisdom we don't understand. It is now not a part of the Quran. But Ubay would recite it as a part of the Quran. And it was came down initially as a part of the Quran. Okay, but these are some, so these are some of the advanced things you should know about them because I'd rather you hear it from me than some Orientalist come and put you some weird ideas and like, well, I never heard this before. Well, no, this is something well known. Ubay knew this, Umar knew this, Uthman, all the Sahaba knew this. And uh, Zayd ibn Thabit, when we get to his tarjama, his biography, we will see Zayd ibn Thabit 
heard the Quran for the very last time in the last Ramadan. And that's why he was chosen, that Zayd knew which ayat were abrogated. Because Zayd was present when the Prophet recited the Quran for the last time for Jibreel. And he then passed away three, four months after that. So that is why Zayd was chosen, even though he was younger than Ubay. But Ubay was not chosen. Because Zayd was there in that gathering. And, Z and, and Ubay was not there. And that's why Ubay would recite. And that's why Umar said, I know you heard it from the Prophet. And he said this in the hadith. I know you heard it from him. But after this, Allah's decree came and repealed it. And that's why he would disagree politely with Ubay. But then in the time of Uthman, it became law that these uh, abrogated verses are no longer going to be recited. Insha'Allah ta'ala. We pause there and continue next week. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.